Okay. I want to welcome you all uh, to this uh, Goldman Forum event. This is the eighth uh, event we've done this year, uh, and it's been a wonderful series. Uh, I'm uh, Orville Shell, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here at uh, Berkeley. Uh, before we begin, I want to just make a few quick announcements. Uh, we have two other events that we are co-sponsoring with the Commonwealth Club uh, that are, are yet to uh, be held. On May 12th, the FCC Commissioner Michael Copps uh, is going to be in conversation with me uh, in the city. Uh, and the subject is, has the public been well served by the public airways? Uh, that's a, perhaps a rhetorical question. Uh, uh, then on Tuesday, June 3rd, uh, the Journalism School and Commonwealth Club will uh, sponsor a conversation between uh, CBS 60 Minutes producer George Kreil and Lowell Bergman, uh, who teaches at school and was a 60 Minutes producer and is now uh, writes for the New York Times and does films for Frontline. And the topic is going to be the CIA secret war in Afghanistan. I want to also uh, thank uh, some of our students who loyal long and hard uh, to make this and other events possible. Jason Felch, Daffodil Altan, Rosa Yum, and particularly I want to thank Marsha Parker. Where are you, Marsha? There you are, uh, for helping put all of this together. It's a, a, a great uh, uh, a deal of work. Now, what we're going to do is we go into the portion of the program which will be broadcast uh, over the Commonwealth Club's radio network, so I have to gavel this to order. Uh, so forgive the, uh, the, the ritual interlude here. I want to welcome you uh, to this event uh, sponsored by the Commonwealth Club of California and the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley. It is entitled Weapons of Mass Destruction in an Age of Terror, Living in the Second Nuclear Age. We have, uh, joining this discussion this evening, uh, four panelists. Michael Nock is the Aaron Vildovsky Dean and Professor of Public Policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy here at Berkeley. He served from 1994 to 1997 as Assistant Director for Strategic and Eurasian Affairs of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, where he led the agency's work on nuclear arms reduction and missile defense negotiations with Russia and initiated nuclear arms control uh, talks with China. We're also joined by the author Francis Fitzgerald, who's written for many publications, including The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books, and The New York Times. Uh, she's the author of a book uh, called Way Out There in the Blue, an award-winning study of the Reagan administration's struggles over missile uh, defense technology and arms control at the end of the Cold War. She's also uh, author of a wonderful book uh, about the Vietnam War in Vietnam called Fire in the Lake, the Vietnamese and the Americans in Vietnam, America Revised and the Cities on a Hill, uh, a third book. Finally, uh, Jonathan Schell, uh, who is the Harold Willens Peace Fellow at The Nation Magazine and also a senior fellow at Yale University in their Center for the Study of Globalization, has for many years was for many years a writer for The New Yorker. Uh, he's a contributor to The Nation, to Harper's, to Foreign Affairs. He's the author of many books, beginning with a series on the war in Vietnam, uh, including The Village of Ben Sook, The Time of Illusion, and a whole series of books since, several of which about uh, on this subject. His most recent book is called The Unconquerable World, Power, Nonviolence, and the Will of the People. Finally, uh, I want to introduce Mark Danner, who runs the Goldman Forum. Uh, he is a professor at the Graduate School of Journalism, a longtime writer for the New Yorker magazine. Uh, he's also a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and the New York Times. He's the author of the book, The Massacre at El Mazote, A Parable of the Cold War, and has covered uh, wars in Central America, Haiti, and the Balkans. So let me turn this over to Mark Danner. And again, many thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, Orville. Um, our title tonight is Weapons of Mass Destruction in the Age of Terror, uh, Living in the Second Nuclear Age. 
It occurs to me that uh, this discussion held a couple of years ago, uh, though it might have attracted a uh, fervent and interested crowd, would by no means have been anything like as, as timely. Uh, one could have argued that weapons of mass destruction, nuclear arms, chemical arms, biological arms, uh, were an extremely important issue, dangerous one, but one couldn't argue, as one certainly can today, that weapons of mass destruction have taken their place as a central or perhaps the central issue in American foreign policy. I have to begin by stating the obvious, which is that we finished, or it seems we have finished within the last few days, uh, a war against Iraq in which um, 130 or so Americans died, 500 or so were wounded, perhaps a couple of thousand Iraqi uh, civilians were killed, untold numbers of Iraqi soldiers died. And this war was fought uh, with its primary cause, at least its stated cause, as the need, the necessity to disarm Iraq, which meant to rid uh, the regime of Saddam Hussein of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, an occupation has begun, uh, one that looks rather difficult. Yesterday, 15 Iraqis were killed and 75 wounded by American troops during a demonstration. Um, and all of this has its roots, uh, at least as publicly stated, in the need to uh, confront Iraq because of its weapons of mass destruction program. Uh, in the last few days and weeks, the administration has had uh, harsh words to say about Syria, um, partly because, as the Bush administ administration has said, it has programs for weapons of mass destruction of its own, and perhaps the weapons of mass destruction uh, that were thought to be in Iraq and have not yet been found uh, may have, according to the administration, been taken to Syria. Finally, the United States has begun, rather haltingly, discussions with uh, the regime in North Korea, led by King Jong Kim Jong-il, uh, over its weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the North Koreans uh, admitted during the first day uh, of those talks, the only day of those talks, uh, that they indeed did possess nuclear weapons uh, and that they were in a position to make more nuclear weapons, perhaps as many as half a dozen by the end of the summer by reprocessing spent fuel rods. They were also thought uh, to have uh, chemical weapons programs and biological weapons programs. Now. Um, Weapons of mass destruction as of, uh, I would say, January 2002, when the President made his famous State of the Union address in which he uh, set out before the American people his vision of an axis of evil uh, involving uh, or including Iraq, Iran, um, and North Korea. Uh, weapons of mass destruction have become the sine qua non of U.S. Uh, foreign policy, or at least uh, the reason um, for confronting certain states it used to be called rogue states. They're now called the axis of evil. Um, the president made um, a, uh, an identity or made an equation. He said that um, one cannot allow, the United States would not allow, the world's worst states to obtain the world's most dangerous weapons said this very clearly, and in the time since, it seems as if, indeed, he is determined uh, to do exactly what he said. So, it's a central issue. How do we approach it? Um, I'm going to ask our distinguished uh, guests here to begin by with three broad questions. The first is, in what way is this policy of the Bush administration uh, an extension of past policy, toward weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, and chemical, and in what way does it represent a break from that policy? Um, and we have here three people who've paid attention to this uh, issue, not over the last year and a half, but over decades. So we'll try to put it in some kind of historical context for you. Second question, 
in what way does this current policy, assuming that it is a break with the past, represent an improvement? What are the risks? What are the strengths of it? And finally, a very broad question. How do, does the administration's policy toward these weapons and the states that either possess them or are trying to obtain them relate to broader issues of U.S. foreign policy in the world, of how the United States is projecting its power? And implicit in this question is, I think, the conviction that things in U.S. foreign policy are changing, uh, that we now, for our sins, live in a period, live in very interesting times, and that uh, this period is like perhaps that of the late 40s, that of the early 20s, in that it represents a reconfiguration of U.S. foreign policy and how Americans look at the world and how they will exert power in the world and how they will deal with other nations. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, uh, our uh, panelists here to take five or six minutes um, to uh, grapple with these questions. We'll then go around again. We'll have time for replies, and we'll have some open discussion uh, before we'll get to, uh, to your questions. And uh, I'll begin with, with Francis Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mark. Um, I thought I'd try and deal with the U.S.-Russian uh, uh, part of this whole rather grim equation. Uh, because I think uh, it's where uh, the Bush administration's thinking about um, U.S. nuclear weapons uh, comes clearest, and where w one can very clearly see uh, both uh, continuity with Cold War thinking and uh, a quite a break from um, the past two administrations. Um, a brief history first. Uh, in 1991, when the uh, Cold War was coming to a close, um, George Bush Sr. carried out what was probably the greatest disarmament effort in history. Uh, just in terms of nuclear weapons, um, he signed uh, two strategic arms agreements, uh, one with Gorbachev and one with Yeltsin. Um, he initiated a very risky and daring um, uh, informal agreement with the Russians whereby both sides would retire their tactical nuclear weapons uh, from Europe. And the U.S. also uh, retired its uh, ground-based tactical nu nuclear weapons from, from South Korea. Um, he elicited pledges from all the former Soviet states uh, that nuclear w weapons remain in, under central control and that those outside of Russia uh, would be eliminated or withdrawn to Russia. Um, he also negotiated a chemical weapons treaty um, and halted U.S. nuclear testing. More important, of course, um, he, along with Gorbachev and Yeltsin, ended the uh, tensions uh, that had been the basis for fear of nuclear war between the, the two great powers. Well, in the later 1990s, um, uh, U.S.-Russian re relations had their ups and downs. Um, there was a pattern of increasingly normal contacts, but also some tensions. And in this period, the Clinton administration um, and many in Washington identified the nuclear threat from Russia as being two. One was the sort of accidental or unauthorized launch of uh, ballistic missiles, and the other was uh, the lack of security around Russian uh, storage sites for decommissioned nuclear weapons and uh, for weapons usable fissile materials. Um, that also, uh, the unemployment of all of these uh, Russian nuclear scientists and technologists. Um, this b brains and, and these actual uh, uh, weapons uh, creates the greatest pool of weapons that might become available uh, to so-called rogue states or to terrorists. And so uh, securing these materials and helping these scientists move into other endeavors um, was clearly in the common interests of both the U.S. and Russia. Uh, and so they began a cooperative effort uh, to, to secure these storage sites and so forth. This effort was not so easy. First of all, um, all Cold War arms control agreements focused on the destruction of launchers rather than warheads. Uh, easy to destroy a launcher, you just cut it up. Um, much more difficult to, to get rid of uh, the nuclear material, materials in a warhead. Secondly, no, neither side had told each other how many warheads um, they possessed or how large the, their stocks of fissile materials. 
just two years ago, I don't know what the estimate is quite today, but um, we estimated that Russia had from between 17 and 20,000 uh, warheads. That is plus or minus 5,000. Um, there was also an estimate that, that there were uh, s something like 700 tons of weapons usable fissile materials in other forms. Well, the nuclear weapons themselves were the easiest to deal with because at least they were large, you could see them, you could count them. Uh, uh, they were under the control of the Russian um, Defense Department and um, you could make an inventory of them, and it was, it's rather difficult for uh, a thief or uh, a terrorist to simply take one away. Um, the fissile material issue is much more difficult, of course, because uh, they were stored they, and are stored in over 50 sites, some of them outside of Russia in former Soviet states, some of them uh, not in military but in civilian laboratories. And the uh, Russia simply had no national inventory of what, uh, what it possessed and what the other states possessed. So over these years, um, the U.S. Uh, put a good deal of money into this cooperative uh, program uh, to, to secure these sites, um, but that was difficult. Russian habit of secrecy, um, lack of transparency and accounting, um, money would often go into somewhat other projects than the ones that had been uh, de designed in the United States. Um, and when we uh, pressed them for further transparency and for, you know, getting, going ourselves to go and count these things, um, they would uh, accuse us of unwarranted intrusion. And, you know, they were not entirely wrong because uh, we didn't want them uh, rushing all over all our, our laboratories and nuclear weapons facilities uh, either. So um, they were something to what they said. Progress was also slow because of competing priori priorities, lack of sustained attention, and of course the tensions that uh, developed over the other course of U.S.-Russian uh, relations such as NATO enlargement, um, uh, well the, also the slump of the Russian economy in 1998-99, and uh, the U.S. bombing of, 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 of Serbia. Also, the Russian Duma never ratified uh, START II, as it called the, sec the second treaty, because it was clear that Russia could not maintain the level, uh, it said, of, of 3,500 uh, strategic weapons. Um, and so, so, so ratifying it would be a sort of a recipe for U.S. nuclear superiority. Um, at that time and afterwards, uh, U.S. estimated that th the Russians could maybe not afford to keep even a thousand um, strategic weapons deployed uh, by the year 2010. Well, there was a good deal of progress, but there were several incidents during the 1990s of small quantities of fissile materials uh, that were, were reported missing or stolen, never found. Um, so clearly a long way to go and uh, what was you know obvious in, in in the year 2000 is what was needed was sustained attention to this problem a lot of patience and a great deal of building up of trust between the two countries well um, uh, Bush too as I call him um, uh, <laughs> a campaigned on um, uh, ending the ABM treaty and deep reductions in U.S. Uh, Russian strategic forces. And he later announced, once he was president, that, that uh, uh, both sides would reduce their forces from a level of about 6,000 strategic weapons to a level of about 2,000, uh, which is much closer to the figure that the Russians wanted. Um, and uh, this was done. Um, both things were done. That is to say, after after September 11th, as, as it happened, um, the U.S. withdrew unilaterally from, from the ABM Treaty, uh, something that annoyed the Russians very much, but they wanted this, this, this new agreement um, uh, badly to, uh, the, on offensive arms. So um, they agreed to that, and then they found that we didn't want a treaty on offensive arms. Um, we finally ended up signing one uh, really to uh, as a sort of a, uh, a sop to, to President Putin, who had helped us so much with the Afghan uh, campaign. Um, 
but it was a treaty really without any substance, um, just a few paragraphs long, that stated that in the year of 2012, the two sides would reduce their deployed strategic warheads to the pr proposed level um, by any timetable and by any means they wanted. Um, leaving both sides free to deal with uh, uh, decommissioned warheads as they wished. Um, and that uh, either side could get out of the, th the treaty with giving three months' notice. <laughs> well, you know, to most sort of professional arms controllers, it seemed a folly to make an agreement that will, uh, would allow um, the would not allow the U.S. to monitor what happened to these 4,000 uh, decommissioned warheads. Um, but uh, Rumsfeld et, et al. Uh, responded that the Cold War was over, Russians were our friends, we could trust them, and, and so forth and so on. However, uh, just a month before this treaty was signed, um, the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review, uh, which is a classified document, was partially leaked um, to the press. And it turned out that what the Pentagon really wanted uh, by meant by strategic reductions was um, taking the warheads off their launchers and uh, putting the, most of them back on a, in an active reserve so that we could um, uh, activate them in days or weeks if necessary. And why? Well, um, the answer in the nuclear posture review was that in the event U.S. relations with Russia significantly worsen in the future, the U.S. may need to revise its nuclear force levels and postures. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that the U.S. is expecting um, another sort of nuclear cold war with Russia? Well, you ask Pentagon planners and they say it's just a contingency. Um, but uh, what's the point of this? Um, after all, uh, the Russians would maintain uh, 2,000 uh, warheads, plenty to d deter the U.S. anyway. What's the point of having more? The point really is that this is old Cold War strategic thinking, you know. I mean, during the Cold War, both sides talked politely about deterrence, but in fact, both of them were engaged in, in uh, nuclear war fighting strategies, um, both uh, the idea being to deter the other side up the whole ladder of escalation um, and uh, to uh, limit the damage if, if uh, war actually broke out. And that's why arms control was always so difficult, and stability or reductions is impossible to, to, to conceive. Well, um, this being done, uh, this, this sort of substance-free treaty uh, against Russian um, uh, protests, uh, Rumsfeld now wonders why the, the Russians aren't cooperating with us very well on securing their, their WMD facilities. Um, but in fact, this administration has put very little money and very little attention into these programs, um, even after September 11th. Incomprehensible, really. Um, and since last May, when the treaty was, was, was signed, there's, there's, uh, they've shown no concern for worsening relations uh, with Russia. In fact, those few agreements we made, again, as a stop to them, trade agreements, that kind of thing, we have failed to to produce. So just to, to conclude, um, for all of the administration's apparent focus on weapons of mass <laughs> destruction, their concerns about it are extremely narrow. They don't worry about Russia. They haven't worried very much about pa Pakistan's fragile nuclear arsenal um, or about uh, India-Pakistani tensions with all the specter of nuclear war on the subcontinent. Both before and after September 11th, they've been focusing solely on weapons of mass destruction from rogue states. Uh, and I say that deliberately because, because um, ever since 1992, the Ch when Cheney was Defense Secretary, um, uh, the, the Pentagon has uh, ha a policy of responding to chemical or biological weapons attacks from, from these states uh, with nuclear weapons. Um, Thus, uh, and the only real strategy for dealing with, with, with uh, this proliferation issue has been, been um, threats. I have to end with a joke since I didn't start with one. Um, and, and that is, uh, uh, 
In 1998, uh, Robert Joseph, who is now uh, the uh, sort of senior uh, nuclear strategy person on the NSC staff, um, uh, was so eager to justify um, uh, maintaining the U.S. nuclear arsenal that he wrote a paper in which he argued that uh, U.S. nuclear weapons uh, could deter Saddam Hussein from using uh, chemical or biological weapons. It's an argument I think that he hopes no one will remember. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Francis Fitzgerald. Thank you. Jonathan Schell. <laughs> Uh, well, let me try for once to do what I almost never do, and I think almost no one ever does, and that is actually to be true to the title of the conference uh, and address head-on uh, uh, that title as, and, and as elaborated by Mark's questions. Um, and so I want to try to do is to compress into a very short time uh, my understanding of what the relationship between terrorism and uh, nuclear danger is, at any rate, in American policy. And this, I'm afraid, will involve stating more than arguing, uh, but maybe we can have ar the arguing uh, in the discussion part. And really what I want to do is to, to define or stake out a position on this issue. Well, in the first place, both dangers, to, to be, state the obvious, are absolutely real. Uh, and no one who lives uh, six blocks from where the World Trade Center once stood, as I do, uh, can imagine that the threat of terrorism is in any way uh, imaginary. On the other hand, I do have to add that it's very difficult to know, it's very nebulous and um, uh, unclear just what the state, what the extent of that threat is. I think it's rather notable that we've had no sequel since September 11th. I don't know at what point you begin to say, well, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be because you were always afraid that the next day it's going to be an anthrax attack in Detroit, so, so pred prediction is really a fool's game there, but nevertheless, it's hard to know. <clears throat> Second, even more obviously, the nuclear danger is, uh, is more than real, uh, and I'd be the last person to uh, uh, miss that point since I've spent the better part of the last three decades worrying about it and writing about it. Um, and in this case, I think that the cutting, end, the cutting edge of the danger uh, is nuclear proliferation, but we can never afford to lose sight, and this is where Frankie's talk was so invaluable, of the fact that the mother load of nuclear arms remains in the United States uh, and in Russia, along with uh, now six other nuclear powers who have, have, have these weapons. Uh, and finally, um, it's Obviously, these two threats are in danger of in intersecting at some point in the form of a terrorist use of nuclear weapons. Uh, the truck bomb in the World Trade Center, uh, whose bomb is made of uranium rather than fertilizer. Uh, now, as neither of these dangers is new, uh, they've been around in the case of terrorism, untold decades, in the case of proliferation, really since the dawn of the nuclear age, and people have thought a lot about what to do about each one. Um, in the case of terrorism, uh, there's no example in history that I can think of of a guerrilla cause that has been defeated by conventional arms. Maybe my audience here will, will think of some exception to that. You might say that the French defeated the uh, Algerian uh, guerrilla uh, uh, campaign, but then promptly de Gaulle gave Algeria its independence, so they must have been doing something right. Uh, and and that, that's hardly a defeat. Uh, maybe the Malaysia, um, the British in Malaysia, but on the other hand, then again it was and the Hucks in the Philippines. Well, that might Hux. be a good one. Maybe you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've got me there. Well, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, when something has had a degree of success in dealing with terrorism, which is one of the most ingrained and deeply embedded and hard to face challenges that, that, that there can be, one thing that is, has seemed to work is just dogged, assiduous, uh, persistent, unrelenting uh, police work. Uh, we've seen some of some success of that in Northern Ireland, in Sri Lanka, maybe in Spain and Germany with the Bader Meinhof gang. Uh, but it's equally obvious that the police work is at best a reliever of symptoms, if that. 
and often it, ra it provokes rather than uh, helping out. Um, and there's a terrible, there's sort of a fateful asymmetry, to use the buzzword here, uh, that is rather in favor of the terrorists because it's always easier uh, to put that bomb in the uh, pizza parlor than it is to find that person who wants to put the bomb in the pizza parlor and uh, uh, capture him. Uh, so it's only really where the police work has been backed up by attention to political issues and political successes that you've had anything resembling a success in dealing with terrorism. And perhaps the most notable example here would be Northern uh, Ireland. But probably the beginning of wisdom where terrorism con is con uh, concerned is to confess to ourselves that there's no surefire solution to this. Uh, whether military or political. It's something that you probably have to live with in most cases for a very long time, usually over a period of decades. And indeed, maybe the passage of time is itself the only true cure to most uh, terrorist dangers. Now, proliferation obviously is an old story too, and so are non-proliferation efforts. And there have been some very clear lessons that have been learned. Uh, and until now, a single dominating answer has been given, and that is diplomacy leading to treaties. And the uh, centerpiece here is obviously the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, and under which 182 countries have agreed to do without nuclear weapons, and only one of them is formally withdrawn. Unfortunately, that's North Korea. It just happened the other day. Now, this is a kind of spectacular success of diplomacy, uh, I want to suggest. And once again, uh, there is no example of proliferation having been stopped by the use of military force. We'll see what happened in Iraq. The jury's out on that, whether they had them in the, uh, at all. Uh, the one attempt that was made was the Israeli attack on the Osiris reactor. Uh, and that is often touted as a great success, but it leaves you wondering why Saddam was on the verge of having the bomb eight years later after the Gulf War. Uh, seems, seems like it didn't succeed so well after all, and especially when you consider that it was following that attack that the rather unpromising plutonium path, uh, which was um, conceivably made possible by the existence of that French reactor, was dropped, and he went to the much more promising uh, uranium path uh, of, of, of obtaining nuclear weapons and proceeded to come within an ace of getting them before he was so foolish as to launch his war against Kuwait before he had uh, succeeded in that. Uh, so the lessons here are, are very, very clear. And in my opinion, there have been excellent reasons for this concentration on the political, the di diplomatic, on the treaties. And it has to do with the very nature of proliferation. After all, proliferation is not a tank division crossing a desert. Uh, above all, it's knowledge passing from one mind to another. Maybe it involves a little technology, as when our buddies, the Pakistanis, uh, took some a little technology and a lot of know-how uh, over to North Korea, setting them on the uranium path in addition to their plutonium path for building nuclear weapons. Uh, in my opinion, it's folly to consider that this, as a global problem, that this type of threat can be stopped by force. Um, or to put it differently, controlling proliferation by force, by coercion rather than agreement as before, would require something approaching political dominance over most of the earth. And of course, this is exactly what the current administration uh, appears to be at attempting. <laughs> and in the name of non-proliferation. So what we really <laughs> have is something unprecedented here in history, which is a series of disarmament wars uh, and actually, if you believe the United States is heading in an imperial direction, and if this is indeed, as Mark said, the centerpiece of that, we have the world's first nuclear disarmament empire. <laughs> so obviously, you will have understood already that in my opinion, the only thing that can give us hope is to get off this uh, path and get back to the path of the treaties, which is the thing we've given up. The answer... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't want, to, don't want to step on my applause. <laughs> uh, very little more to go here. Uh, <laughs> we should return to the negotiated path 
And in my opinion, its destination must be the abolition of all weapons of mass destruction, including our own, as the organizing principle and goal. Now, obviously, <laughs> I didn't know it was the applauding kind of audience. I mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, Obviously, to discuss that goal is a, a bridge too far for my few minutes, but I'll just comment uh, that I think I know as well as the skeptics of that goal how hard it will be, how arduous, and how long it will take, and what a true revolution it would be in global affairs. It would be as hard as World War I or World War II or the Cold War, but it would be a peaceful struggle for peace, and I think it's the only way to go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan Schell. Um, we'll now hear from Michael Nacht, who I have to remind the audience is the only person on this stage who has actually had to deal with these problems and has gotten paid for it, rather than, <laughs> Not much. Rather than <laughs> sitting around and, and thinking about them. Right. So, Well, and uh, just so you won't have to applaud any further, <laughs> I, uh, it, while I'm speaking, I should uh, mention in the interest of transparency here, that uh, in addition to serving in the Clinton administration, I uh, chair a, a, currently I chair an advisory committee of the Department of Defense in the Bush administration on counterproliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So you can relax until I finish and then go back to that. <laughs> um, I'm going, I th Mark has laid out a vast set of very important issues and questions here. Again, I'm going to take a couple of quick slices at it in just a few minutes. The first I, uh, point I'd like to trace for you is the evolution of American government thinking about the proliferation of these weapons through three stages. And the words uh, are different and the words are important. From non-proliferation to managing proliferation to counter-proliferation. From the time the United States detonated the first device in Alamogordo in July 45 and then used them against the Japanese to terminate the Second World War, there's been a lot of concern in every American governmental administration from Truman through the current one about the proliferation of these weapons and more importantly about the use of these weapons once they proliferate. It's not just that they're going to spread but that they're going to be used. If they were never going to be used, you know, there's a kind of bean counting exercise but it's not that important. The fact that they might be used is what's important. Um, uh, the first, there were, I won't go through the whole history, it's a rich and interesting history, some of which uh, Francis Fitzgerald has commented on, um, and so has, has Jonathan. Um, in, the, in the 50s, Eisenhower initiated the Adams for Peace Plan, which was intended to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, kind of as a payoff if countries forswore the acquisition of nuclear weapons, without fully understanding the linkage between peaceful nuclear power and nuclear weapons, because you can operate nuclear reactors, as some of you well know, uh, produce weapons-grade material from them through plutonium, uh, separate the plutonium out and build bombs. And you can also uh, enrich the uranium, both of which the North Koreans are doing. Um, from 1945 to 1960, five countries acquired nuclear weapons, the US, the Soviet Union, now Russia, uh, Britain, France, and China. And uh, in the very early 60s, the uh, writer and scientist C.P. Snow warned that by the end of the 60s, there would be 30 countries with nuclear weapons. There was great concern about this. And he proved to be wrong because it turned out a variety of countries looked hard at the nuclear option. Italy, Switzerland, Sweden, Germany, possibly, some of which story is not yet fully understood, and many others. And they stepped back from the decision unilaterally, without any negotiations, without treaties, without pressure. They looked at it on their own and decided it wasn't in their best interests. There was maybe security that they received from the United States or elsewhere that compensated, whatever. Anyway, by the time, after the Kennedy assassination and into the Johnson years, there was a felt need to stop the so-called vertical to, to stop, stop the so-called horizontal spread of proliferation of nuclear weapons. So far, I've only talked about nuclear weapons. Now, again, words matter. We're still in the non-proliferation phase here. Stop. Non-proliferation means 
stop it, stop the spread. And um, that was achieved in, in part, in large part diplomatically through, as Jonathan has articulated uh, very carefully, the Nonproliferation Treaty, which was signed in 1968 and entered into force in 1970. But it didn't completely solve the problem by any means. It solved the problem for many countries, many of which, of course, had never planned to get into this business. Uh, Pacific Island states, Central American countries, they're very sub-Saharan African countries who had no interest wherewithal, you know, they're, they're not in this game. Uh, but there were others who were in the game. And when Ford was president after Nixon resigned in the 70s, uh, several countries seemed to be moving toward nuclear capabilities. Brazil, South Korea, not North Korea, and Taiwan. In each case, uh, they were not then in the Nonproliferation Treaty. A Ford had limited leverage to use against them. There was very much a sense it's better that we have them and that they don't. The notion that it's a hypocritical approach I think is unquestionable. I don't debate that point. It is hypocrisy. It's saying it's better if fewer have them, in fact, if only we have them. <laughs> That's unabashedly the American governmental position. It's been the American governmental position from 1945 till tonight. So if you want to change the position, you're going to have some work to do, as Jonathan has <laughs> laid out. Uh, what did they do with Brazil, North Korea, or South Korea, and Taiwan? We muscled them. We muscled them uh, through quiet diplomacy, not through grand multilateral negotiations. We sent key American officials to each of the capitals and we said, cut it out or we'll hurt you, not militarily. In the South Korean case, we might tear up the security treaty and withdraw the forces from South Korea, leaving you unprotected against the North, which had attacked them in 1950. Against Taiwan, we said, cut it out or we'll drop any pretense of protecting you if the Chinese should attack you. And against the Brazilians, we worked with the Germans who had supplied nuclear reactors to the, to the Brazilians to stop the program. In each case, it, as far as I know, it was successful. South Korea, Taiwan, and Brazil walked away from nuclear weapons. Still in the non-proliferation phase, but now I would say moving into what you call the management phase, finding other things to do beyond large multilateral institutions. Not throwing away the multilateral institutions and the multilateral treaties, but supplementing them. Then you have into the 80s, I'm going to not make this a whole historical exegesis here, but what began to happen in the 80s and then into the 90s was first the realization that chemical and biological weapons were spreading. Now, they had not been used much at all in warfare uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, frankly, they were never kind of the hot button ticket to a great career, <laughs> either as a writer, I think, or certainly as a government official. Uh, you just didn't make it big. This was too much of a sideshow. The, the center of the circus was nuclear weapons, not these other things. But then, when Iraq used, nuclear, Iraq used chemical weapons in the Iraq-Iranian war in the 80s, and then when the chemical device was used by the Ayam Shinrikyo, the Japanese terrorist group in the Tokyo subway in the early 90s, there was a growing concern, you know what? These weapons can be used, will be used, if not by sovereign states, then by terrorist groups. And we have to very much watch that spread as well. So that I'd say by the time we were getting into the Clinton years, after the Bush, first Bush administration, there was much more concern about the whole panoply of, uh, of proliferation. Um, let me finally get to Iraq, which has hardly been mentioned so far after Mark's uh, a comment. I think Iraq represents a kind of special case, in my view, <coughs> where it was at least believed by this administration. And why did they believe it? Because they had intelligence, which may be wrong, some of which I've seen, quite a lot of which I've seen, and unless half the intelligence community is making it up, with photographs of mobile biological weapons trailers, with communications intercepts, with testimony of former scientists, unless it's all a phony, this guy has a lot of stuff, or had a lot of stuff. Where it went, I don't know. Whether it's deep underground, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in Berkeley, I don't know where it is. <laughs> uh, Greenwich Village is another option. It could be in lots of places. Uh, I still think there's a, well, I, I won't go into whether it's a likelihood of finding it. That's a whole other story. Uh, I do think that the reason for going into Iraq was, in law, was 
A central issue was WMD. It was clearly not the only issue. It had to do with a demonstration of U.S. force to deter others from behaving the way Saddam Hussein had behaved. I think it was an effort to begin a process that the Bush administration believes could lead to democratization of some of the Arab and Muslim world, as fanciful as that might seem to this group. Uh, and there were, other, there were other objectives. But clearly WMD was a central objective. So how, how different is the Bush policy now? And we'll get more into this. We have plenty of time in the Q&A. I would say what Bush has done now is elevated the third part from nonproliferation and managing proliferation, counterproliferation, to the centerpiece of his policy. Counterproliferation was always a, a bow in the quiver of American policy, but it wasn't used very much at all. Now, the military arm, and it's not just the military arm, it also includes active defenses like missile defense, it includes passive defenses like gas masks. It includes um, <clears throat> a variety of means to nullify the capability of these weapons without destroying them, and it includes destroying them. <laughs> uh, this is all under the rubric of counterproliferation. They've got it. We can't do anything about it. They're a threat, and if we don't do something about it uh, in, ter in terms of nullifying what they've got, we could be the target of it. The final element that's new and, of course, unique to the Bush team is that they're doing this in the context of 9-11. And again, this group may be totally skeptical, 100% skeptical, that there's any linkage, that there could never be a linkage, it's impossible to have a linkage uh, between a sovereign state like Iraq and Al-Qaeda because of theological differences. One's a secular state, one's a theocracy, and uh, deep the theological, theocratic roots. I only point to a couple of things. I point to the fact that politics and war make strange bedfellows. And there are many, many thousands of examples that would run counter to this logic. I'll just give one, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1938. There couldn't have been two states more viscerally opposed in every dimension of life than Nazi Germany and Stalin Russia. They made a pact, basically to carve up Poland and some other countries. It didn't last long, because then Nazi Germany wanted to carve up Russia. But uh, the notion that bin Laden and al-Qaeda uh, and Saddam Hussein could not in any conceivable way co collaborate, to my view, is not, uh, is not sustained by, uh, by any reasonable reading of history. So, what, is the Bush people, what are the Bush people concerned about? Are they just maniacs? Are they neo-fascists? Are they imperialists? <laughs> you, you, I did get it. <laughs> You knew, you knew that was I know how I do it. I know how to do it. <laughs> in my view, in my view, and I'm a, uh, as a member, a product of the Clinton administration and a Democrat for many decades, their dominant concern is what Jonathan said in the beginning, that there could be other terrorist attacks with weapons of mass destruction right here on this territory. And that the only way the terrorists are likely to get these weapons is to get them through cooperation with sovereign governments. It's conceivable they can manufacture some of these things, but it's tough. They need collaboration. That's why Bush is verbally, at least, and in the case of Iraq, physically targeting those states that could collaborate with him. That's why North Korea is so important, because every, almost everything that North Korea has built, they've sold. The missiles they built, they've sold. The weapons-grade material they built, they've sold. So unless you feel that it's you know, a totally hyped uh, threat, and of course you're entitled, we're all entitled to our views of this, then I think it's something that anyone in a responsible position of government authority has to take seriously. And it would be some mix of nonproliferation, managing proliferation, and counterproliferation. It would also include, frankly, in my view, things that the Bush administration hasn't done, shoring up the Biological Weapons Convention and the verification of those uh, items, which they have not done. The same thing with the Chemical Weapons Convention. There are many, many technical and other issues here. But I do think WMD proliferation is a key uh, issue. I think Mark is, has painted the questions very correctly. And I think it will, and I think countering WMD will remain for the foreseeable future, not the only piece, but a centerpiece of American foreign policy. Thank you. Michael Knott. <laughs> Um, I think this notion of counterproliferation is a very good place uh, to begin the second part of this uh, discussion. 
Um, it's worth noting, as alluded to uh, by several of the speakers, that when we talk about weapons of mass destruction, we're talking really about three different uh, kinds of weapons, which are both are, are very different in their effects, but they're also very different in the determination and resources needed to develop them. Um, nuclear weapons obviously are very expensive, take a, a significant uh, industrial base and research base uh, to make. Um, chemical weapons, at least some chemical weapons, can be made, if I understand it correctly, rather uh, easily uh, by any country with uh, a fair amount of industry. Uh, biological weapons, some of them can be made easily, some not. And they have very different, obviously very different effects, particularly in the ability to uh, trace them. Uh, biological weapons can be surreptitiously delivered. Uh, nuclear weapons, obviously uh, not. You know once they've gone off. Um, I think uh, we should start the second phase here in discussing whether the administration's policy of counterproliferation uh, is indeed uh, a wise policy uh, and whether it can, uh, whether it will make the United States safer uh, and more secure or less secure. Um, we've had in the last few days, uh, certainly in the New York Times and other organs of the press, uh, worries expressed that uh, one problem in taking so long to find or uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq may be that these things uh, will have a greater chance to get out of the country. Uh, or indeed that um, the war itself, the attack, uh, was a pretext uh, for members of the establishment, the scientific establishment in Iraq, to hasten these weapons out of the country. And if that is indeed the case, uh, does it not cast uh, a rather dark light on this policy of counterproliferation and trying to counter the danger from these weapons through waging war and changing regimes? Um, I wonder if we could go around uh, more quickly uh, and talk about that. Um, Frankie? Well, it seems to me it's obvious that you need a mix of strategies to, to deal with these things. I mean, not everything um, uh, gets done the same way. And, and indeed, uh, uh, Michael Nacht is right about, uh, you know, uh, you simply, um, uh, a lot of firm persuasion of Taiwan and so on was needed from the U.S. to do this. And it wasn't a matter of a matter so much of a treaty, but it was, it was muscle. Um, but it was political muscle, diplomatic muscle. Um, this administration, I don't see as, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I see them as being in, focused on counterproliferation to the ex exclusion of nonproliferation and, and indeed even management, because if you, if you talk about Russia, I mean, that's management. Um, and, you know, what worries me, for example, Iran seems to be on its way to developing nuclear weapons. Uh, let's just talk about Iran for a second because it's, it, others are better, probably better understood. But, you know, even, even um, the moderates in Iran, the reformers in Iran, um, are for a program for, of, for developing nuclear weapons. Why? Because as far as they're concerned, they live in a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, India, Pakistan, nuclear armed, and of course Israel. Um, and well, I'm just talking about nuclear weapons here. So what do you do about that? I mean, if you look at it from the administration, what is, has happened in the past, the answer would seem to be to, to, to bomb the Iranian uh, nuclear reactor when it gets going. Um, uh, because we don't seem to be able to persuade them that it's not a good idea to build this, these things. Um, but is that a good idea? In fact, what happened in the case of Iraq was that they, they put their nuclear labs underground so we couldn't see it. And they added, uh, they went from 500 scientists to 3,000 working on the programs. As a result, they made a good deal of progress. So, you know, it seems to me that, that this kind of, kind of single, you know, silver bullets kind of solution, that it just doesn't, doesn't work very well. Um, and goodness knows what havoc it would cause if, if we tried the same thing in Korea because uh, but solutions tend to be tend to be political, and they tend to be worked out over a long period of time. Um, and you know, you cannot deal with with India and Pakistan 
uh, so nuclear weapons without, without thinking about Kashmir and how you set, settle that and so on. I mean, I really think the approach has to be, has to be political. Jonathan? Yeah, I, I think there's a real choice that has to be made between the political and the, and the military uh, approaches to, to, to nonproliferation. That is nonproliferation, not counterproliferation. Uh, the, re the reason is that the military approach spoils the political one. I think the political one has to be the mainstay, and it's upset and destroyed by the, by the military action. We see this very clearly in recent uh, events. Uh, we've gone into Iraq. We've knocked out that government. We're looking for the weapons. Maybe we'll find them. Maybe we won't. Maybe they'll be in Syria, although I don't think that uh, the Bush administration administration would think that that had been a very good result if before the war they said well Saddam won't, Hussein won't have but they'll be in Syria and, and heaven knows whose hands uh, and yet that's now being suggested in defense of the policy but my point is uh, that the Iranian uh, the, the war in Iraq very visibly and clearly prompted an escalation of nuclear preparations in North Korea and Iran, both of which have specifically uh, cited their, their, their lack of a desire to have regime change practiced upon them. <clears throat> uh, and also, if you look at the North Korean example, uh, where they says in the newspapers that there can be a million casualties in the first day. That's just the first day, and that's without nuclear weapons, which they say they have and we have. So it looks as if the counterproliferation approach, introducing force into this tangle, uh, is completely unworkable in the case of North Korea, or unless you're willing to pay a truly historically horrendous price. Uh, price. It could be the first nuclear war in history, and as much as there's never been a nuclear war, there's just been a use of nuclear weapons by <coughs> unilaterally by the United States against Japan, unilaterally in the nuclear sense. Uh, so. Um, it seems to me that we have to get back on the political path. Now, immediately, and I know I'm talking too long, but, I'll, but people will say, oh, sure, go and tell Saddam Hussein, please, Mr. Hussein, uh, get rid of your nuclear weapons, and please, Mr. Kim Jong-il, you too, won't you hand them over to the world community, that that's even more toothless than the military, perhaps. But that overlooks, I think, uh, the strength, and here I don't have the time to develop it, but. Uh, the idea that if the world were able to commit itself, that is the existing nuclear powers, to moving over a period, let it take 10 or 15 years themselves to getting out of this nuclear business and thus out of the weapon of mass destruction business altogether immediately in the present, that would produce a kind of unity of purpose which is notably missing in the United Nations for the last two rounds. You'd have an, in, you'd have an implacable pressure at that point, and unity to use diplomatic and even the military means, then if someone else in that world were to pop up and say, the whole world's getting out of this, calling it a crime, maybe a crime against humanity, but we're getting into this business and we alone here in Iraq are going to have this while the whole world is getting out of it. Could I, could I uh, play the devil's advocate here and say that it seems to me that um, when you talk about incentives and political pressures, as Frankie did, uh, that lead people to want to develop weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological, uh, is not one of those, uh, one of the changing incentives. The fact of uh, that it is indeed chemical and biological are a poor man's nuclear weapons, and that the United States, in fact, would be far better off now, uh, given its enormous conventional superiority, if there were no weapons of mass destruction in the world. So that the path to counter a uh, power much more powerful than you has to be the shorter path. And in, in this way, you could conceive the, um, uh, the WMD policy of the United States as essentially trying to make the world safe for conventional weapons, because the United States does have overwhelming conventional superiority. Um, so in that sense, it, doesn't, it seems to me it doesn't necessarily make sense uh, what you're arguing. I'm not sure Sorry. I follow that last part. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't make sense what I'm arguing. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is that the incentives will always remain for much weaker countries oh, yeah, okay. uh, who cannot match in conventional arms the United States or the greater powers to try to take a shortcut. I mean, terrorism is in, conceived in this way another shortcut. 
uh, so that the political incentives will remain pushing people to try to obtain these weapons, if not nuclear, then uh, biological and, and, and chemical. Um, oh, Michael, I'm sorry, do you want to take a crack at that? Um, well, on the question of a kind of uh, WMD free world, uh, I think in some moral sense it's a very laudatory uh, goal. On a, in a practical sense, uh, it cannot be verified because chemical and biological weapons in particular are based on so-called dual-use technology. And you can have a fertilizer plant today that can be involved in chemical weapons development at night. And just being realistic, I mean, you think that the United States is all pervasive. Look how many mistakes we made in the, just in this Iraqi war, which we won pretty handily. Look how many things we didn't know. Look how much surprise we had. And we had tremendous advantage in, uh, in our uh, reconnaissance and our communications intelligence and every aspect of intelligence. Look how many things we didn't know. It is, to me, literally, and I rarely use the word impossible, but I would say it is impossible to verify with high confidence a world in which states just declare that they don't have this stuff. Uh, maybe you can get somewhat down the road, but it, it's, to me, hard to visualize getting too far. On the issue of decoupling political versus military instruments, again, all I can say is in the, in the way governments have behaved, are behaving, and in my judgment will behave, maybe erroneously, political and economic power and military power are all inextricably linked. There's a reason the United States has political muscle. It's because of its economic might and its military might. There aren't many countries with tremendous political influence that have a weak economy and no military. <laughs> and Peter Tarnoff, who's here and was a key architect of uh, Clinton foreign policy in the first Clinton term, I think can tell you uh, more credibly than I, perhaps, that, uh, that the threat of a military action in the background is always there, always useful, always used as an element in making one's political case, as is economic power. There are sometimes cases where it works very well, by the way, but they're rare. An example, and you may have seen it, there was a very interesting piece which I highly recommend to you by a former colleague of mine from the Clinton years, Rose Gottemuller, uh, in the New York Times just this past week on the Ukrainian example as a model for North Korea. Uh, perhaps most of you did not see it. The short version is this. When the Soviet Union collapsed, and you know, December 31st, 1991, it existed, and the next day it didn't exist, <laughs> January 1st, 2000, uh, two, uh, 1992, uh, we learned that there were uh, three other states of the former Soviet Union that had nuclear weapons, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. And we went into a full court press. It started at the end of the Bush administration, but frankly not too effectively. It went into high high gear under Clinton very effectively, leading to the removal of all nuclear weapons from Ukraine. What was done was a very detailed, complex negotiation with the security guarantees by the United States and Britain and Russia for Ukraine security. Ru Ukraine was not so interested in a Russian guarantee because the Russians, as they say, the Russians <laughs> always visit us. Uh, they wanted an American and a British security guarantee, which means use of military force if they're attacked. They wanted economic assistance. They wanted energy assistance. And they wanted American support in the destruction and removal of these weapons, all of which we provided. So the notion that political and military can somehow be decoupled and one is counter to the other, I just don't think bears scrutiny. Now, could it be that an excessive emphasis on counterproliferation and on the military instrument or the threat of the military instrument is itself counterproductive and could stimulate proliferation? Mm -hmm. I believe it, yes, absolutely. I personally believe that. And I personally would not conduct my diplomacy and my uh, sort of political posturing in a way that says we have only a military card, we have no, we're not interested in diplomacy, we're not interested in treaties, we're not inter interested in, I don't, I think that's counterproductive for our own national interests. So I don't support that. But the military element, I think, will be there. 
But is, is our current policy setting up a set of incentives that lead in that direction? In other words, that lead toward proliferation. I mean, you're very eloquent on talking about Ukraine and others, but if I understood Frankie's point correctly at the beginning, uh, this administration is notable for its lack of interest in doing the hard political work uh, and hard technical work uh, that's necessary for securing noose, uh, loose nukes and loose nuclear material uh, within Russia. They've shown themselves particularly uh, uninterested in that. Well, I'll just comment briefly. There, there is continuing work of this cooperative threat reduction program. I know a fair amount about it. I would say they're not in any way uh, in the leadership positions of the Bush administration nearly as enthusiastic and supportive of it as the Clinton team was. But it's, not, that a little, as, but it's not, not a little surprising given their yes. focus on weapons yes. of mass destruction? Yes, absolutely. I think it's, 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 a, it's a mistake. How do you account for it? I think because, here I'm guessing, I think that the leadership thinks that Russia in many ways is yesterday's newspaper. I really think they think that that, um, you know, when Clinton came in, the focus actually also shifted away from nuclear arms reduction, but even though I was involved, to economic development and democracy. That mm -hmm. was the feature, primarily, of U.S.-Russian relations. I participated in four Clinton-Yeltsin summit meetings. I was there. I was in the room. I heard what they said. I saw the papers prepared. I prepared some of the papers. We did make some progress, but it was pretty marginal. And it was marginal in part because the administration didn't have that as a top priority. And also Yeltsin had his own, had, had his own problems. So on, on, Russia, on, on Russia, I think, yeah, I, I don't personally support that view. Let me make a quick comment on India-Pakistan, which is very important, and I think only uh, Frankie has mentioned this. Um, I don't personally believe it is the case that this administration has neglected it. There was a very dicey situation last summer, summer 2002. I think many people in Washington thought that war, even nuclear war between India and Pakistan was imminent. Several senior people, including Rumsfeld, I believe, and Powell and Dick Armitage, visited them. And they visited them the way the Ford people went to Taiwan and Korea in the 70s. They said, cut it out. <laughs> They may have said, maybe we'll give you some goodies on the side. There might have been some secret agreements. I don't know. But they were not indifferent to an India-Pakistan conflict, a nuclear conflict. And I can tell you that the administration is not at all uninterested in what's going on with Pakistan's nuclear program, because Pakistan, should it go through a political upheaval and lead to an Islamic fundamentalist regime, could become an al-Qaeda-led, al-Qaeda-type-led state inheriting a nuclear arsenal. So this administration has a lot of interest in it. Maybe they're not handling it in the proper way. There's a lot of not in the newspaper. Um, but I don't think it's fair to say that they're not, they're not uh, paying attention to it. Could I just respond to that? Sure. Please I, do. I, 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 you're perfectly right that, that, that when a crisis erupts um, between India and Pakistan, something gets done. Uh, I don't think they pay the kind of sustained attention to it that, would, that it is necessary to work towards a, uh, a settlement of the Kashmiri question, which was really a possibility, it seemed to me, after September 11th, strangely enough. And that, you know, it's one thing to respond to a crisis. And by the way, there's a small crisis, as you know, the other day. And the it, Indian officials were, uh, were, were discussing military options just the other day. I, you, their, their diplomatic um, schemes have gone very thin. I mean, there's, there's very, very little um, uh, left that, that one side can do to the other. Can't withdraw ambassadors anymore, no more ambassadors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can't stop buses, no buses. So um, it seems to me that this is the kind of sort of gardening um, that you have to do. And it's only an administration that thinks that way. Uh, can, can succeed. Jonathan? I want to go back to the uh, point about inspection. I, I'm, I'm not going to obviously discuss that hugely ramified and uh, complex subject. Please, um, please do. But you know, I want to well, point out, it seems to me a nub here that I'd like to get back to is, as Michael phrased the issue, whether the counterproliferation policy itself that is responding, if need be, with force is going to make the political work necessary, which needs to go with it more difficult. 
That yeah. is, whether it's counterproductive and whether these two things can coexist uh, successfully. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to address just that point. Uh, that it's certainly true that inspection is a very, very tall order. It's very, very difficult, especially with the biological and chemical weapons. And I suppose the implication there, which has been explicitly drawn by the Bush administration, is that since we cannot really control the biological and chemical, then our weapon of mass destruction of choice has to be the nuclear weapons so that we have some deterrence uh, in that case. I would argue that the response to an anthrax attack on the United States should not be a nuclear weapon on the country uh, that, that launched it, that conventional response would be perfectly adequate. But the deeper point is this. The idea of getting out of the business of weapons of mass destruction, which I see as an essential uh, goal, uh, is that you have to make a, uh, certainly that is fraught with difficulties. It's not without danger. There are very great difficulties. There are very great dangers. Inspection is one, enforcement is another, and so on and so forth. But what the point of comparison can't be between that world and a perfect world. It has to be between that and the world that we're hell-bent into right now, which includes the likelihood that North Korea is going to pop up uh, with more nuclear weapons, a full-fledged nuclear program, and that we may see the nuclearization of Japan, who knows, South Korea, Taiwan, and so forth, reversing all that progress that uh, uh, M Michael talked about. Now, therefore, you, you have to make a choice, it seems, a fundamental choice between a coercive world, where you deal with that problem with coercion, fundamentally, a fundamental commitment, like the Bush administration, or else one, where you make a fundamental decision for cooperation. Now, even in a cooperative world, I would see a role for force. For instance, if the, if the as I said before, if the great powers are all on the same page, and, and all the other countries will be on that page, too, and somebody gets up and says, no, I want to have weapons of mass destruction, I think you'd have the will of the world to oppose that, including military force. Now, but with the Bush administration, what we see is zero commitment to the political across the board. I won't go through the list of treaties that they pulled out of or are not interested in. You all know them, I think, by heart. But they, but they have zero interest in the political. They, they approach with the drawn sword. And the result of that is what it has always been throughout history, which is that it prompts a like response. It prompts people to want to take that shortcut that Mark talked about, to get the nuclear weapon, or maybe it will be the biological or the chemical. So that seems to me to be a, you know, a, very, a very short path to an inferno. And it's that world that the choice for coercion leads to that has to be compared to the admittedly fallible, imperfect, difficult to achieve world of a we uh, uh, committed to and moving towards uh, no weapons of mass destruction. I think this, this leads us well into, uh, into a question that I've gotten from the audience, which has to do with in specifically where we are headed uh, in our nuclear policy now. Uh, the questioner points out that the U.S. is about to embark on an effort to develop a new generation of nuclear weapons, uh, bunker buster bombs, and after that, smaller uh, weapons. Um, the Bush administration also wants to begin uh, testing weapons again. And I'd add to that that um, there have recently been reports in the press that some of the weapons, um, the missiles that were supposed to have their warheads taken off and were essentially supposed to be retired, will now be fitted, or at least the idea is being brooded about, that they'll be fitted with conventional warheads. These are intercontinental continental. Uh, ballistic missiles. That's an idea that's been raised. Uh, it's unclear whether any decision has been made regarding it. Um, could please uh, comment on the administration's plan for its nuclear arsenal now, for these plans that have been advanced? Michael, do you want to start? On that? Well, um, you remember at the end of the Second World War that Hitler allegedly was in a bunker. Uh, so bunkers are not new. Uh, after the Israelis destroyed the Osiric reactor in, in Iraq in 1981, uh, the Iraqi response was to proliferate bunkers, hardened, deeply buried underground facilities in which they developed uh, their weapons. And it was not only in Iraq. The United States has such facilities. Russia has such facilities. China has such facilities. And now it's alleged that there may be thousands of such hardened, deeply buried targets in various countries of interest around the world. Uh, the military 
uh, always has to wonder, you know, supposing they ask me to destroy a target, can I do it? That's their job. They don't do the big geopolitics. Their job is if the political leadership says, see that thing over there? Knock it out. They don't want to be in a position to say, you know what? <laughs> we can't do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> can you come back tomorrow? Or I can hit this, but I can't hit that. So this has led to a very considerable research and development effort and also political lobbying effort and many different efforts to get at these hard, hard, deeply buried targets, which has led to some advocating small nuclear weapon use against these targets and the development of small bunker buster weapons and others who say we can get them with the right combination of conventional weapons. And you may recall in the first hours, well, what started the Iraqi war was the intelligence information that Saddam Hussein and his two sons were in a hard, deeply buried target, eight to ten stories underground. I mean, these are gigantic facilities, the rooms this size, ten stories under the ground. And um, what was done was two uh, uh, special conventional bunker busters were used, followed by 40 cruise missiles to destroy that target. Because you can do calculations. Guys in the civil engineering department here do calculations about what explosions do to structures. Um, so there is an ongoing theme that's now quite important in the defense community about how to attack these targets. That's not the, it's a, only a partial answer to your question but it's an important answer. And a lot of it has to do with conventional weapons, but there's also, of course, a nuclear community who says, we know the answer, and it's small nuclear weapons. And what will this do? <clears throat> I mean, I'll move this to Jonathan. Um, the general question of what's being talked about uh, with respect to development of new nuclear weapons, what will it do to the nonproliferation regime and so on, about the general direction of Bush administration nuclear policy? Well, there are lots of things that military people can't do. Uh, we couldn't destroy the Soviet arsenal during the Cold War. We can't destroy the Russian one now. So the question always is, uh, when they want to be able to do something, is it wise to give them that particular weapon to do that? In my mind, to cross the nuclear threshold uh, in the name of the very marginal military advantage, that historic thing that would change history forever, to recross the nuclear threshold in the name of getting into some bunker a little better than you could do with a conventional explosive is monumentally out of proportion. And the problem, of course, is, not, is the policy that's behind it, because it's only in the context of this policy that I think is so deeply mistaken of preemption or prevention of regime change and, and acting to knock out you know, someone's uh, nuclear weapon program as soon as they have a gle gleam in their eye that such a weapon could make sense. Right. Uh, and that whole policy, to me, seems to have the really disastrous consequences that you know, I've tried to outline. Well, what about the broader <coughs> question, again, of where uh, the Bush administration is taking nuclear policy, that is talking about testing again, not just bunker busters, but testing weapons again, um, and possibly also mounting conventional warheads on intercontinental ballistic missiles? I really think this is old Cold War thinking, um, sort of gone mad in the, in the, in the post Cold War uh, era. It was because mad already, it was mad already, <laughs> but it was never mad actually. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't small and small letters mad. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's a mad mad world. The first time with small letters, then with big letters. But I mean, you know, I mean, we developed every kind of of nuclear weapon during the, during the Cold War, uh, tiny ones, large ones, you know. Um, all over the lot, and in, in fact, we have a, we have something that's supposed to be a bunker buster. It had been developed, you know, before before this administration began. It doesn't apparently work very well, or it's it, or that is to say, it's it's uh, um, it's uh, much too high yield to, to use. Um, uh, but it seems to me that that. Um, um, you know the the problem of this kind of thinking is that you never it never ends. You know you you we we need this we need more of that we need more of that and if that's that's your only um, objective if your if your focus is so much on the use of military power being power um, and you don't understand other kinds of power um, then then we're in trouble. Is this? Uh, 
you know, you've, I think you've been very eloquent, Michael, in talking about the institutional forces mm -hmm. that lead uh, that lead to us making or lead to the government making decisions like this. Do you think that's an accurate uh, description of what exactly is happening? That is, decisions about testing again, bunker busters, possibly the decision about uh, putting conventional warheads on ICBMs. In other words, uh, Frankie was just saying, well, this is, uh, we're talking about Cold War thinking gone wild. I mean, how do you account for this set of policies now in the Bush administration? Well, I, you know, I do think a number of the key people in the administration had these ideas before they came into government. There's no doubt about it. I, I know a number of these people. I've read their literature. I, you know, I, I think that's a fact. I do think that 9-11 has been a tremendous stimulus to the whole enterprise. Even if you see it completely decoupled, they do not. Because, they, again, they see a linkage between rogue states mm -hmm. and terrorist groups. And they feel if they leave the rogue states as depositories of these weapons, uh, free to do what they're going to do, uh, it's impossible for us to know all of the side deals, quiet meetings, handoffs, uh, especially as Al-Qaeda itself has morphed into many, many different groups. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have to have, I mean, it really would have to be an Orwellian world. And we're not, we, some of us may think we are close to, we're at an Orwellian world, but we're not. No country, the United States or any other country, can have that kind of global surveillance system. Do I actually think, though, that in the absence of major attack, that the United States would use nuclear weapons? I personally do not. I don't think so. Would we build some new ones? Very possibly. Would we resume testing? Possibly. I know it's in the early stages of being thought about. It's now, there are now seminars on it. It's now being discussed. There are now draft papers about it. And of course, there was none of that in the Clinton years. But the Clinton years now seems like the Roaring Twenties. And this seems like 1942. It's just different. There are different people, uh, but so I'm, I'm still hopeful. I don't want the nuclear weapons threshold crossed either. I think it would be a, uh, you know, it would be a fundamental step from which we could never return. And it would have to take something so catastrophic uh, to justify it. And I can speculate on what that would be, but I, won't, I don't want to make you more depressed than you already are. Well, I'm not afraid to make you more depressed than you already are. So we're talking about rogue states. We have several questions here from the audience about North Korea and the current uh, state of what's going on there. Uh, when we talk about nuclear weapons in North Korea, what exactly does that mean? Are these Hiroshima-sized weapons? What are we talking about? Um, Another question, what's the logic of allowing, that's in quotes, North Korea to develop nuclear weapons by re refusing to negotiate with them? That's perhaps, um, Bush now talks about containing their threat. Uh, and finally, a uh, questioner asks to play out several moves ahead in the nuclear chess game in North Korea. What's going to happen uh, in the near term? Do you want to start on that? Yeah, I'll make the mistakes and they can correct me. Good. Uh, <laughs> Well, let me say that um, North Korea has exhibited interest in a nuclear weapons program for 20 years, 20 years, that we know about, 20 years, since <laughs> at least the early 80s. Um, they reached a pinnacle of uh, American interest in the early 90s when they looked like they were going to reprocess the fuel from their fuel rods and produce, extract the plutonium to build a plutonium bomb. This is what led to the uh, intensive negotiations between the Clinton government and the, uh, at that time, Kim Il-sung government. Uh, Jimmy Carter visited uh, North Korea, frankly not under, with tremendous enthusiastic support of Bill Clinton. They were not close buddies. Uh, but he did visit North Korea, and I think at a very key moment, just before I think Clinton was ready to make a pretty important decision about redeploying more forces to South Korea, which could have been a provocative act, uh, Jimmy Carter told the president that uh, he had a deal. Jimmy Carter had brokered a deal with Kim Il-sung. They were ready to freeze their program under certain conditions. 
and that ultimately led to the agreed framework, which was signed in October 1994. When that agreement was signed, it froze the, this program. It said they're going to stop doing what they're doing. It didn't say they're going to dismantle what they've got. That led to tremendous criticism by many people who are currently in the Bush administration that said this is a mistake, it's, illus it's illusory, it's the liberal diplomatic mind gone wild, you don't understand who these guys are, it's just a matter of time until they resume their march. Then you have the meeting in October 2002 with uh, Assistant Secretary Kelly where they tell Jim Kelly, yes, we have uh, got a nuclear weapon and in fact we've, we have a separate secretive clandestine uranium enrichment program. We've got two different programs to develop nuclear weapons, not just one. You thought we had one. <laughs> we have two. <laughs> <laughs> and folks in the uh, conservative uh, community said, we told you so, we told you so. And that has then brought us to the current situation. What is likely to happen? I mean, my sense is Kim Jong-il, who replaced Kim Il-sung, by the way, Carter meets with Kim Il-sung, and right after that, Kim Il-sung drops dead. It's true. Mm -hmm. Had a heart attack and died. So be careful if Jimmy Carter invites you for the negotiation. <laughs> um, but uh, he died, and Kim Jong-il took his place. He's a 60-ish uh, year old, uh, very short person who has platform shoes and has a big pompadour on his head that's not his own. He loves jazz records, Louis Armstrong in particular. He drinks Hennessy booze and he imports Swedish teenagers for his entertainment. This is all highly documented. There's no doubt about that. He's a wild and crazy guy. He's the Steve Martin of international relations. It sounds uh, like Jimmy Carter's influence on him was limited. <laughs> exactly. So, could I say here in Berkeley tonight what's going to happen with the, this fellow? I, I find it hard to imagine. I think he wants a deal. Whether he's willing to give up his nuclear program to get that deal, I'm not certain. I think the Bush administration has held a very tough line with him. Bush has said, you know, they said when unilateral with Iraq, we should be multilateral. Okay, we're going to be multilateral with North Korea. We want the Chinese. We want the Russians. We want the South Koreans. We want the Japanese. And then we go multilateral, they say, no, we should be unilateral. Okay, there's a, a little bit of game playing there. But I think ultimately, I'm hopeful there will be some sort of diplomatic deal. I think it's in everybody's interest. Will there be a diplomat? Will there be a deal? That's not at all clear. The room for misunderstanding and miscalculation is gigantic. And war is, is not at all. Uh, an impossibility or even uh, a low probability. I'd say it's a medium probability. It depends on how things go. And I think I'll tell you what a lot of it will turn on in my own personal view. It will not depend so much ultimately on, uh, from a military perspective, it will not depend on the nuclear program, which is ongoing. It will depend on the American confidence that they could nullify the North Korean ability to destroy Seoul before North Korea does that. I think if, the, if we have no confidence that we can do that, and remember, you know, the, you know the geography, I mean, there are a million men forward deployed on the demilitarized zone just north of the demilitarized zone, 35 miles from Seoul. There are several thousand artillery tubes of the north with conventional weapons targeted on Seoul. Seoul's 12 million people, half the South Korean economy. The United States is not going to go to war, frankly, in my view, if Seoul will be destroyed and 12 million South Koreans and 37,000 Americans are going to die. There are 37,000 American troops between the 12 million people in Seoul and the demilitarized zone. But is it a dangerous situation? Absolutely. Is it, in my view, the currently top priority in dealing with a nation state? Yes. It's an extremely dangerous situation. Jonathan Shaw, do you have a word? <coughs> Yeah, well, you, it's, it's hard to believe it after we've just been through one war that another of orders of magnitude more destructive uh, is in the offing here, conceivably. Uh, but it's so. And uh, to my mind, the situation there is the uh, demonstration of the bankruptcy of the, uh, of the administration policy. Because they have locked themselves into a policy of ultimatum, uh, of force, of giving orders to other countries who are just supposed to roll over and obey them or else suffer regime change, so-called, or a preemptive strike, and, and so forth. 
Now, as we see, what the cost of that can be, the, the million lives in the first day, and so on and so forth. So either that is a completely infeasible policy, or it is one with uh, a sickening, you know, history-changing cost attached to it. Now, how on earth are we going to get out of this? You have two of the most stubborn, militant governments on the face of the earth. On the one side, you have the delightful Kim Jong-il. On the other side, you have President Bush. <laughs> I, I'm not going to make cheap jokes. Uh, I'm going to point out, though, that he has staked the prestige and the reputation of the United States and its role on the world on this policy that Mark uh, defined at the beginning of our panel that he's got a way of dealing with weapons of mass destruction and he is not going to permit, not permit, that's the language of ultimatum in international affairs, the worst regimes to have the worst weapons. And here is the worst regime with the worst weapons. So either the Bush administration has to roll over or Kim Jong-il has to roll over and I don't see either one happening. Now, there is on the other hand a very sensible, excellent solution to this problem which is that uh, uh, the, the North Koreans would be given uh, what they want, that is to say, a security guarantee from the United States that we will not attack and overthrow them, and all kinds of economic things, and I'm willing to pay a very high bribe for this, personally. Uh, plus all kinds of things that assure their safety and, and, and help them out. Now, uh, uh, that's on the one side, and then on the other side, they would, they would give up their nuclear program. To be perfectly honest with you, though, I am not sure that either government w will buy into this solution. It's entirely possible. In fact, in fact, there's no sign yet that the Bush administration, or very little, that they are really to go down this very sensible road. Because the U.S. and North Korea have no quarrel. Back under the Clinton years, they declared, we, have, we are not enemies. We, have, we, we are not in a state of enmity with one another. And there's, not, there's no issue between them except the quarrel itself, so to speak, and, and, its, and its weaponry. So, but I'm not sure that the, that the Bush administration will offer it. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure that if it did offer it, that the North Koreans would accept it. Because the, uh, the number of countries that have voluntarily, or, or not voluntarily, under coercion from without, uh, surrendered their nuclear arsenals is zero. The only uh, country that ever really did that, Ukraine is a slightly separate case, was South Africa. And in that case, it was a white majority gene, regime uh, they didn't want to pass on nuclear weapons to the black majority regime, suggesting that the only thing that trumps up uh, uh, people's love of nuclear weapons is racism, <laughs> unfortunately. Francis Fitzgerald, a final comment? Well, this is, again, my point about gardening. I mean, the, 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 first, the, the, the first thing the Bush administration did when it came in to, to office was to cut off talks with North, North Korea. Um, and we simply, you know, didn't, didn't talk to them at all until just recently. Y you have to un understand what's on other people's minds uh, in order to deal with them effectively in whatever way, whatever way you choose. Um, but, uh, and to my mind, the North Koreans uh, have brought the, the crisis up to this point um, because that's really all they, they've got. I mean, the, you know, uh, or is this threat of, of, of nuclear weapons. What bothers me now is mistakes being made. Um, it, it's about, it's Rumsfeld maybe withdrawing U.S. troops from South Korea. Um, that is going to bother the South Koreans and all the neighboring countries a great, great deal. It's people making remarks, as he has, uh, well, we'll get the Chinese to sort of choke them off economically, you know. This is not diplomacy. <laughs> I mean, we have managed to alienate our, one of our greatest allies in the world, South Korea. In the, in the, it's unimaginable that we have, how we've done that. But, but um, uh, so, I mean, even short of a nuclear war, there could be a lot of terrible things that happen in this region. And I'm worried about mistakes. That happy note. <laughs> I will say that I have a handful of questions here, and um, I'm sorry that we're not able to get to more of them tonight, but I thank you for your fervent interest, and I can say that these subjects 
will be revisited by the Goldman Program and by the Journalism School of the University of California in the future. Uh, thank you for coming, and I hand uh, uh, the microphone, as it were, over to Dean Orville Schell to close the session. Well, it may well be that we will be here again next year with the same panel and the same topic under consideration. Uh, I hope not, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Please join me in thanking uh, the panelists, Francis Fitzgerald, Jonathan Schell, Michael Knox, and Mark Danner, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club and the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California. Thanks for coming.